Close to 60 years ago, I heard a story about this verse in, in uh, uh, Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. That was refer reference to their testimony as believers. They understood what being saved really meant. They had... Uh, they absorbed themselves in what it meant to be a child of the king, a child of the Lord. And, uh, and they overcame by the word of their testimony, not necessarily the word of their mouth. Their life spoke volumes. They were known by what they believed, and they were known because of what Christ had done in their life. And they love their lives, not unto death. They understood, uh, as we should, that our mission in life is to finish our race. And how we run the race, and how that the Bema seat is going to bring much joy and some sorrow. And when we live in the light of eternity, it affects who we are and why we're here. Uh, this story, probably 60-some years ago when I first heard it, and it's never failed to have an impact on my life. If you saw the movie Hoosiers, it's about a, a basketball team that uh, was a lot like the movie Hoosiers. Me being a Hoosier, uh, growing up in Indiana, uh, I love basketball. I was just too short in the wrong color. But anyway, uh, <laughs> this had a special impact on me because of being a Hoosier. And this was about a country school in, in Indiana uh, that had uh, broke a lot of records. They had a team of uh, guys that had worked together from junior high school all the way up. And they were so good as a team that people began to predict that they would come a day they might qualify to win the state championship. The odds obviously were against them, but they continued to play with such finesse and uh, their junior year, they came second in the state. So they really were a team that could function and work together. Their senior year, they obviously were up to compete for the state championship. And they had won every game that they had played up to the finals. And now the state championship was on the line. And it was being held at their high school gym. And uh, the enthusiasm of that community and a lot of the people across the state came to cheer for those guys. And uh, it was the most exciting time to say the least. The captain of the team was a believer. He was a serious believer. And he lived his life. And the school knew where he stood. But when the big night came, uh, up to the halftime score, they were 15 points ahead at halftime and it looked as if the championship was in the bag. When they came out for the second half, the captain brought the ball down. He dribbled down to about half court, stopped, dropped the ball, and fell over dead. The place was shocked. 
when the coach, part of the staff, and the doctor got to this kid, when the doctor said with a very soft voice, he's gone. The weeping of that crowd of people was amazing. They just couldn't believe their eyes and ears. Well, they decided to have the funeral in the gym. And it was totally packed out. I mean, it was, some people couldn't even get in. And uh, the pastor was at the one end of the gym with the, the casket, and he stood up that night and he said, people, we are all baffled over the results of this young man's life. No one has any idea what took this boy. It doesn't make any sense. He had perfect health. There was no rhyme or reason for his demise. And all I can say is that uh, he lived his life as a believer, and everybody knew where he stood. And so I'm here tonight to ask you that if you're here without Christ, without salvation, without the faith that this young man had, then tonight is your night to make that commitment that he made. All of a sudden, the teacher stood up and walked up to the coffin and said, uh, people, I may be able to give some rhyme or reason to what happened tonight or last night. He said, many of you know I've been a teacher here for years and I went to this school and I played basketball for this school and I was so proud of this team and to watch how far they had come. So in reminisce, I decided after school, Friday night, I decided to walk over down the gym just to reminisce about the good old days and what it was like when I played and how proud I was of this team and how far we've come. And I walked and walked down by the gym and then I walked down for the boys' locker room and all of a sudden I heard some voice. It was intense. And he said, I tiptoed into the locker room, and the, the further I got, the louder the voice, till I came by the edge of the locker, and I turned, and this young man was on his knees. Praying over a bench. And I heard him say, you know what this night means to us, God. You know what it means to the school, what it means to our town. But there's something that means more to me. My four buddies that I have shared my faith with never came to know you. And as much as I want this championship, there's something I want more than that. I want to know before I leave this school that my four buddies have come to know you. And I'm praying pretty boldly about this. And I don't care what it takes. Whatever it takes, I want my buddies to come to know you the way I do. Even if I have to die,
He said, I'd never heard anybody pray like that in my life. I've never heard anybody with that kind of commitment, that kind of intensity, that kind of compassion. And all I can say is that it might be the reason we're having his funeral in the celebration of his life. And he went and sat down, and the pastor saw the situation, and he gave an invitation. And the first four who stepped forward were his four buddies who came to Christ. You almost don't know where to put a story like that. You almost wonder, uh, is there people here today who feel that way, who have that kind of burden, who are praying for somebody who's lost and praying with a certain kind of boldness? But many of you and, and I know that our lives don't belong to us anyway. We've been bought with a price, and the price was high. And that's why what we stand for in this church, what we represent in this teaching, has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with our destiny, our purpose for existence, why we're here. And when you look at the condition of our land and you look at the way that the youth are being isolated from the gospel, why do you think we live in a country now that outlawed Christianity in the public schools? It's because we said nothing. It's because we stood by and shook our heads and said, well, what are you going to do? Well, I just pray for a certain urgency in all of us. This last month has been a real gut check for me. I've never really known total weakness like I've known this last few weeks. And it was a wonderful experience because we've been taught that weakness is what God is trying to teach us so that we can get over ourselves and fulfill that passage in Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives to the death. I am so honored to be a part of this congregation and a part of this church and a part of you. And I thank you for your support and your prayers and your encouragement. Because I'm not through. I don't know what it means to be through. I want to run this race until I see his face. And I've got a few hundred uh, more kids this summer that I'm going to be able to talk to up in Pennsylvania and maybe over in, uh, on the West Coast. But I thank you for your prayers. I thank you for this pulpit. I thank you, Ron, that you refuse to compromise. And I don't know what we're going to be doing in Moody, but in the meantime, let us redeem the days because you know they're evil. And you continue to pray for us who have anything to do with the youth and giving them hope. We have what they're looking for. You know that. There is no other hope. There is no other encouragement. There is no other 
system of thinking that can give them the ability to overcome all of the traps and all of the hypocrisy that's being thrown in their face. I want more kids. And we pray again for the camps that Tony will be a part of and some of us have a chance. We continue to pray for Deb and Boyce. I'm so sorry that the Alabama camp shut down. But the Pennsylvania camp is still going on and there will be a camp out on the West Coast that I hope to be a part of in August. Let us love not our lives unto the death. What is death to us? By the way, we don't die. If you're absent in the body and face to face with the Lord, I don't think there's a whole lot of time between the soul leaving the body and your face with Jesus Christ. You haven't got time to die. You got time to rejoice. To see him without regrets. To let go of anything that would hinder or distract us from the mission God's called us. Many of you are quiet and faithful in your little world, and because of that, some of us are able to go. And I'm so grateful for that. And I'm so grateful for this uh, church. And what is Memorial Day? It's a daily encounter with the grace of God. That's what it is. Apart from his grace, we got nothing. We got nothing worth remembering apart from the blood of the Lamb, our testimony. And God help us to get over ourselves to the point where we're fearless to face whatever God has for us. Father, thank you for this story. I know it's true. I know this kid was serious about his friends coming to know you. Father, we know people who we ought to be praying in the same vein. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this reality. Thank you for these people. And thank you that the church still sends people out for the one thing that matters the most, the eternal knowledge of Christ. So, Father, I praise your name for that. And I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I thank you for these warriors who stand strong in season and out of season. In Jesus' name, can I lead you in the pledge as we dismiss? And if Ron wants to come up and go another hour, be worth it. <laughs> Attention. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hua. God bless America.